We all have that one story, don't we? The one you grow up thinking about, but never actually grow the balls to tell anyone. Well, this is my story. I don't know what I'm hoping to accomplish by telling you. Maybe I'm looking for someone to tell me that I'm not insane. Or maybe once I put it on paper it will... Hell, I don't know. I'll just someone read this. Just please. Let me give you a little background. Twenty years ago, when I was eight years old, still living with my mom. My friend Dave and I decided that we would brave the house. Now the house was an abandoned two-story home that had been empty going on ten years, save for the occasional drug abuser that would sleep in it. However, that's not what made this particular house special. The standing rumor is what made it interesting. For as long as I can remember, adults in my neighborhood had told us, the children, that it was haunted. I'm sure it was just their way of getting us not to play in it, though. Regardless, because of that, the house had a sort of ominous aura that hung around it. Just looking at that decaying building would give you the shivers. Although despite our inherent fear of the place, Dave and I decided we would explore this house. We would become legends in our own right. At least that's what we hoped. It was Tuesday all those years ago, well past midnight and both of our parents had fallen asleep. The two of us decided we would sneak out, you know, use the night as our cover. We agreed it would be best to meet up in front of the house. Still, I wish we hadn't agreed to do it. There I was, alone, waiting in front of the house for my friend. I couldn't help but feel small when I looked at it. It might have been old and the wood may have been rotting, but man, did it look enormous. I bet even adults fell dwarfed by it. To keep myself from chickening out, I decided to think about something else while I waited. It was a little cold that night, which was the typical weather after a hard rain. Ah, crap, I muttered, noticing the mud that covered my shoes. I should have paid more attention to where I was stepping. Mom is going to kill me when she... My voice trailed off when I heard a dull thud from behind me. It sounded like someone knocked a door. Was... Was it the house, or was I just imagining things? I spun around expecting to see a hairy monster behind me. Instead, it was just the house. Broken windows, splintered wood, and roof. That had more than a few holes in it. Just the usual, nothing to panic about. I should have been relieved, but I found myself slightly shaken. Soon I would be stepping into one of the most feared places in our neighborhood. I wasn't even inside yet, and I could already feel the slight tremor in my hand. Before I could reconsider the mission, Dave arrived. I quickly stuffed my hands into my pockets to hide the quiver. I could see his small figure bouncing up and down. The little jokester was skipping across the street. My fears were immediately replaced with giddy laughter. You're such a clown, I managed to say in between my giggles. We both reached out and shook hands like his father had taught us. Luckily he didn't notice the tremor. Dave used his hands to smooth back his black hair, kind of like a greaser would in a cliched movie. You ready for this? He nodded towards the door. Typical Dave, he always tried to look cool, whether it be riding his bike with no hands or sneaking into an abandoned house. He never failed to give off the I'm a badass vibe. I tried my best to sound nonchalant. Only if you are Davy. The comment awarded me a slight sneaker. Dave hated it when I called him Davy. He said it sounded girly. And that's exactly why I used it. Rather than shoot a retort at me, he simply nudged me towards the house and we began walking to the door. Our small feet made quiet echoes in the street. I was worried we might wake someone. If we had any doubts about what we were doing, that moment would have been the right time to bail out. 
Of course, as per the norm, stupidity got the better of us. The second our feet hit the old steps, we knew there would be no turning back. Think we should knock, Dave joked. Seeing him act all cool somehow gave me courage, and so I knocked him. What I heard made the hair on my neck stand at attention. The same thud I had heard from earlier reverberated through the, through the door. When my knuckles landed, I gulped loudly, but maintained an overall calm composure. The two of us breathed in deeply, turned the doorknob, and pushed the door open. We received a long, drawn-out creak as payment. I thought I was going to pee my pants, and Davy looked like he was about to shit a brick. Somehow we managed to keep our undies clean. It was dark, real dark. Neither one of had brought a flashlight. We didn't want to accidentally wake up a neighbor by shining a light in their house. Given the circumstances, we decided it was best to use moonlight. Our eyes were met with a dimly lit house. It took a minute to adjust to. The house was littered with trash covered in graffiti and was seemingly falling apart all over and yet it didn't seem as frightening as we were led to believe sure the darkness made it look spooky but as I looked at the cracked marble floor I couldn't help but be reminded of my house huh this isn't so bad it was me who broke the silence do you think the ghost will be pissed that we tracked Maud in the house? Dave laughed and pointed at the floor. Little footprints followed us all over the house. Remind me to clean my shoes before I go back home. I giggled at the thought. Here we are in the big, spooky house, cracking jokes about muddy shoes. It was all fun and games. After familiarizing ourselves with the first floor, which consisted of an empty living room, a kitchen with rotted food in the cupboards, a bathroom with a disgusting toilet, and a curious-looking locked door. We decided to explore the second floor. We ascended the stairs together, Dave leading with his brave face on. The wooden stairs were old, much like the rest of the house, and each step left us wondering if it would collapse beneath us. Think the ghost is up there? I asked, half sincere. Dave chuckled at the question. Ghosts probably aren't even real. We had reached the end of the stairs and were on the top floor. It wasn't a big second story. Two hallways, one to the right and one to the left. Four rooms for the two of us to explore. Let's go left, Dave suggested. So we went left and into the first door on the right. The door was already open, so we just peeked our heads in. The first thing I noticed was the hole in the roof. Moonlight was shining through it, and it gave us a faint light to survey the room with. It wasn't a very kind room. Actually, it was kind of like my room. Probably big enough to have a bed, dresser. Maybe a desk could fit in it too. We couldn't see inside of the closet though. The light didn't quite reach it. Dave looked at me, and I looked at him. I bet there's something cool in there. Let's go look, Dave suggested with a mischievous smile. Not sure what we were hoping for exactly. A treasure in a closet or something. Just before I stepped into the room, I heard the familiar thud noise. The one that was made before. And when, I knocked on the door. My heart felt like it was going to stop. The noise was distant, but there was no mistaking it. My first instinct was to run, but I couldn't leave Dave behind. He of course paid no mind to it. Hell, he was already in the room walking towards the closet, and it was at that moment that things went to hell. I never even had the chance to warn him. The second Dave stepped foot, in the center of the room, there was a frightening crack. He didn't have time to react. The wood splintered, the ground beneath him gave way, and he fell through the floor. 
I nearly jumped out of my skin. Everything in front of me was crashing down. The wood was so old and decayed that it couldn't even support Davy. Dust and dirt flew everywhere. By the time it was over, it was hard to breathe. Wait, Dave didn't make a sound. Did he die on impact? Was he okay? My mind had never asked raced so fast. Dave, I shouted in between coughs. Dave, are you okay? I repeated the question a few more times and waited. After an agonizing minute, I got my response. I'm okay, he answered weakly. Not a scratch on me. I peered down the large hole that was now in front of me. Dust was everywhere, but as it cleared I could see him more clearly. There was Dave, and he was completely intact. And guess where I am? I sighed deeply, glad that he hadn't lost his sense of adventure. I'm in the locked room. Get down here. I'll open the door for you. He wiped the dirt off of his forehead and motioned for me to come down. I obediently turned around and headed for the stairs, preferring to take the safe route down. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I noticed something odd. Were those big footprints always there? Two frighteningly large footprints had been left on the floor. There was something odd about them, though. They didn't look human. Too big. Four toes, and they were round. My imagination quickly got the better of me, and I could feel the panic rising quickly. I was starting to feel nauseous, even more so when I realized the footsteps were leading to the room that Dave was in. I glanced at the front door. It was open. I could leave right now, run home, and tell my parents to call the police. We didn't have cell phones back then, but I didn't do any of that. I just kept walking towards the locked room. The door was open, and I could see shadows dancing on the door frame. There were two shadows, one big one small. The larger shadow was pounding into the smaller one. I could hear the blows landing. Thump, 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 thump. Each time it hit, Dave would whimper. I was frozen in place. The door was only a few feet away, but I couldn't bring myself to take another step. I wanted to save my friend, but I just couldn't move. I could only stand there and watch the shadows. Please, stop. Smash. The last hit was harder than any of the other's ones. I could hear the bones break from where I was standing. Dave's shadow stopped moving. The larger shadow picked up the frail little body and began slashing into it with what looked like a blade. A dark liquid splashed onto the door and started oozing towards the floor. I wanted to puke. I could feel hot liquid running down my pants. Must have been scared enough to piss myself. I looked at the floor and saw the puddle that I had made. It was time to leave. I took one last glance at the door, and what I saw when I looked up still haunts me today. A large, humanoid figure stood in the doorway holding Dave's body. It was too dark to see it clearly, but I got a peek at its eyes. Its big blue eyes. Big and blue like the ocean, and the waves were rippling with rage. I wanted to leave. No, I needed to leave, but my legs refused to move. They were anchored to the floor. Fear had stopped them completely. My heart, on the other hand, was moving. It was moving very fast. Reluctantly, I stood there, staring at the monster that was holding my dead friend. It didn't take long for our eyes to meet. We stood there in an eternal staring contest. I was too afraid to blink. I remember thinking that if I closed my eyes, I would never open them again. It was only after two long minutes that I could finally feel my legs again, so I slowly took a step back. The monster mimicked my movements by stepping forward each time I took a step back. My heart sunk when I realized what it was doing. Every molecule in my body was telling me to turn around and sprint, but could I really outrun this monstrosity? No, there was no way. I decided to keep my pace by myself time until I got to the door. 
Once we reached the living room, it dropped Dave, outstretched its arms towards me, and grinned. It was the single most wicked thing I had experienced in my life. The monster's grin, from corner to corner, reached both of its eyes. His teeth were long, white, like a shark. We were almost at the door, but he was no longer mimicking my steps. For each step I took, he took two. Step by step he was closing the gap. The moonlight from the window shined on his outstretched arm. Its hand was human-like, only there was something off about it. The nails were long, the skin was rotted, and some of the flesh looked like it had scratched off. It was enough to make me dizzy. Soon I could hear it breathing. Each breath was labored, it was almost wheezing. One more step and I would see its entire body in the moonlight. I didn't want that. The thought alone was enough to make me turn, grab the doorknob, throw it open, and rush out of the house. I didn't dare look over my shoulder until there was some distance between the two of us. I expected to turn around and see the monster lumbering after me, but surprisingly it wasn't. The monster never came out of the house, it didn't chase me down the street, and didn't rip me to pieces. It just stood there, on the porch, waving goodbye, its malformed hand slowly rocking back and forth with the same deranged smile on its face. A few days later, when the police report was made public, my parents told me that the monster was just a hobo on drugs. The police had found Dave's body next to a dead homeless man. Apparently he had overdosed shortly after I had left. I tried to tell myself that I was just imagining things and that there was no monster, but I don't know what to believe. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I can't get that fucking smile out of my head. I'm done with this. If I write anymore, suddenly I'll start having nightmares again. Food's here anyway. I just heard a knock at the door. I'm posting this tonight in the hope that it will clear up the misunderstandings surrounding the disappearance of Deborah Lindsay Kane at the risk of my personal ridicule, sticks and stones and all that. None of it will matter after tonight. Consider this my one pathetic attempt at an apology, if nothing else. It's sort of my fault what happened. Even in her heyday, internet blogger Sugarcane was just another web comedian. She was funnier than average and certainly skilled with a pen, but otherwise no more remarkable than the rest. For years, the circumstances surrounding her disappearance were only occasionally mentioned, and only in the most obscure threads on a couple of forms. She would have been forgotten forever if those city workers hadn't found the tape recorder last Monday. Sugarcane's true identity was a boyishly cute redhead named Deborah Lindsay Kane. Her sister Peyton described her as a bag full of fists, nails, and opinions just looking for an excuse to bust open on somebody, nourished by beer and spite since our papa died in 1921. Deborah unintentionally began her career as a humor blogger when she let her friends talk her into setting up a MySpace account. She thought blogs were self-absorbed, whiny, and without substance and thus used her MySpace page to parody the asinine ramblings of her peers. After a while, she graduated to belittling popular culture and occasionally reviewing books, comics, movies, and whatever hate mail she received from her growing reader base. She quickly realized people enjoyed her writing, and by mid-2005, she ditched her MySpace account and set up her own humor site, Sugarcane Junction. Despite Deborah's more than decent writing, the site was mediocre at best. Most net junkies likely never knew she existed, much less that she'd vanished 
and possibly been murdered until the city workers found the tape. Sugarcane Junction never failed to celebrate whatever holidays and festivals came its way and its seasonal articles were usually the most eagerly anticipated. Deborah composed surprisingly witty drinking songs for her Oktoberfest review and a touching poem for Father's Day that she refused to talk about afterward. For her 2005 Christmas rant, she wrote a series of parodied Bible passages that broke her weekly hate mail record overnight. Back then I was known as Dead at 50 and counted among Sugarcane's regular readers. During the first week of October 2006, I suggested that she spend the night in the Daly family's haunted house and write about the experience for her Halloween article. She announced to her readers that I was a child and a moron. I added a $1,000 prize to the mix. She eagerly accepted. On the last week of October, Deborah announced she would make the hour-long drive to the daily house for a spooky sleepover. She embarked on the evening of the 29th, encouraging her readers to stay tuned for the details of my $1,000 journey through the haunted daily house. I had every intention of awarding her the money, and I never would have mentioned the dailies if I had known what would happen. Deborah always researched her subject before or after her journeys, as she called any experience she blogged about. Stay tuned for the dirt on my journey through the latest Scorsese flick, if only to make her praise, mockery of it all the more complete. In her apartment, the police found stacks of newspaper clippings about the Daly family as far back as 1960. Praise for Kevin Daly and the lives he saved as a firefighter, his marriage to sweetheart Naomi Welch in 1970, the birth of their son, Jeff, in 1971, Jeff's growing fame as an abstract artist at only 12 months of age, the rumors that Naomi deliberately dropped her son down the stairs and caused his borderline autism, and of course the fruitless search for the bodies. When the family vanished in 1982, the bulk of the articles were testimonies from neighbors and friends about the last they saw of the dailies. Jeff's performance at school dwindled, but the work he produced in art class was as detailed as ever depicting macabre realms of twisted abstract shapes and looming shadows. Imagery he hadn't produced since he was a toddler. He claimed that the whisperers made him draw these things. His only explanation for a whisperer was, they follow me around my house. I can't see them, but I know they're there. I don't think Jeff Daly was dreaming. I think his subconscious was a doorway to other worlds, and maybe his mother knew it and tried to kill him. If that's the case, I wish she'd been just a little more persistent. Kevin's co-workers described him as nervous, constantly on edge, like he was being followed by a lunatic and couldn't shake him. Naomi, normally known to greet her tavern's patrons with bright smiles and warm hellos, seemed to have crawled into a shell and refused to come out. She took frequent bathroom breaks, only to curl up inside a toilet cubicle and cry with her hands over her ears. And then one day, Jeff never showed at school, and his parents never showed at work. They'd vanished into thin air, and according to their neighbors, they didn't go quietly. Other articles described strange but seemingly unremarkable sights and sounds on the abandoned daily property from 1989 to 2004. A few of those articles were so strange they were considered hoaxes or gross exaggerations. A neighbor's dog ran barking under the daily porch. When he returned, it spent the next two days whining and cowering and howling miserably for no reason. One morning the owners woke up and found the dog missing. It was never seen again. A young couple claimed a silhouette in the shadows of the front yard, whispered something at them, 
as they walked past the house late one night. They couldn't tell if there was someone there or not, and when they continued their walk, the shape stalked them for several blocks before vanishing altogether. Several mailmen gave identical accounts of hearing movement and gibbering voices inside the house while on their routes. One assumed it was the local pranksters and alerted the police. They never found anyone inside. Earlier this week, the city workers were preparing the house for demolition when they discovered the recorder under an old desk. Remembering the house's history of missing persons, they turned it over to the police. The officer who received it, a friend of mine whose name will go unmentioned, had at one time been a sugarcane fan. I spent an entire evening listening to the tape at his place. To help spread this story around the web, I have prepared a transcript of the recording for my own site, which you can read below. Tape begins with 15 seconds of silence, broken by husky female voice. Don't think I've ever been to this side of town before. Had to stop at a diner and get directions cause I managed to get my stupid ass lost. Supposed to be an hour long drive, but it'll be close to midnight by the time I find this dump. Oh, I told the lady I was coming, to visit an old friend who lived in the Dolly's neighborhood and she was happy to help me find my way. Imagine I won't be well received if I go around telling everybody I'm spending my weekend breaking into other people's houses. Even if the dailies are too dead to give a shit. Silence for eight seconds, a sigh. I feel silly going through with this. On the plus side, I'll get to pay my rent for the next month. It is now 11 p.m. on the dot. Took me forever to find the stupid house. Kept turning down the wrong streets. Hard to miss it once you find the right one. The front yard is a jungle of wary vines and three-foot grass infested with species of insects never before seen by man. You can't even see the front door from the street this late at night cause the shadows gulped it up. Parked two blocks away and walked. Gonna find a window to climb through. Hopefully won't need to pick the back door cause that'll take forever, more as it develops. Hollow footsteps on old wooden boards. A series of distorted thuds as the recorder rattles violently. Silence for 16 seconds. Tripped. Ow. It's pitch black in here. Where's madame? Quiet shuffling for the next minute. And more footsteps. Debra releases an exhausted breath. Taper rattles slightly. Okay, I'm in. My camp is set up in the... I guess this was the office. There's a dusty old desk next to the window. I just climbed through and a bookcase to the right of the door. Both are bare. I'm about to take my tour of the house. Camera ready. Although this place isn't much to look at. Keeping the flash off. So the pics might need to be tweaked when I get back. I ought to keep the flashlight off and just let my eyes adjust, but yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Two minutes of silence, apart from footsteps and the occasional electronic shutter sound of a digital camera taking pictures. A cough. The house is a really roomy two-story deal. Oh, there you are, you elusive stairs. The carpet's been all torn up except for one corner of the living room. So the floor's all crusty wooden boards. Footsteps. Loud, human-like shriek of pain from the rusty hinges of a door. Deborah lets out a startled gasp, curses. A moldy bathroom untouched since 1982. Several coughs as the camera clicks. More squeaking hinges, significantly quieter. More camera clicks. Goddamn wolf spiders everywhere. Seven minutes pass with footsteps, camera clicks, and Deborah's coughs the only sounds. Halfway through, 
hollow thunks of boots on wooden stairs, and footsteps change to loud, unhealthy creaks. Now and then Deborah makes various comments on the house's layout. Unintelligible muttering. Dust in this place is murdering me. Second floor is rickety as hell. Here's hoping the building doesn't collapse on me in the night. Hollow thunks again as she returns to the first floor. At the ten minute mark. Dead silence for approximately twenty seconds. Deborah exhales. I think that's it for the tour. I'm off to sleep with the spiders. Silence for two minutes. Deborah whispers to herself inquisitively. Wooden clunking. Found a loose board in the office floor. Previously pried up loose. I'll have to check that out tomorrow morning. Clump of steel toe boots carelessly tossed onto wooden floor. Rustling of thick cloth. Coughing. Oh God. I can't breathe in this place. Right. Time for bed. We'll finish up our notes tomorrow. Good night. Recorder rattles. Deborah begins to say something. Only gets the first syllable before going quiet again. Silence for another minute. There's something in here. Pit-pat of bare feet. Silence. Door creaks shut, rustling. Fucking rats. I knew it. I hear him scuttling in the living room walls. I should have brought a cot. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Well, I won't be sleeping tonight after all. So I'm prying that board up to pass the time. More as it develops. Recorder rattles as it is set aside. For the next five minutes, there's nothing but fingernails and there's something metallic. Possibly a Swiss army knife, scratching into wood, and occasionally a clunk, a gasp, and the clatter of a small object. Deborah's bare footsteps move out of range, another minute of silence. Deborah says something too far away to make out, and seems to wait for a response. She repeats herself louder. Who's there? Nothing for a minute and a half creak of the office door closing. Pit-pat of bare feet returns, the tape rattles. I'm losing my mind. I could swear I heard. Silence. The scratching and clunking returns, and moments later there's a wooden clatter like a board being tossed aside. Gotcha. Paper rustling. Um, more paper rustling silence. Um, there's drawings, water drawings stuffed into this little space beneath the loose board. I think they're Jeff Daly's pictures. When he was five, he used to draw his board dreams to... No. This can't be real. The detail is, um... Crumpling. Wadded paper. Being unraveled and then flattened out. Deborah speaks quietly. Almost inaudibly as if reading something aloud to herself. Don't listen. It's not daddy. It's not daddy. It's not... Silence. A deep, trembling breath. Okay. Um... Okay. This isn't funny anymore. A distant sound, possibly out in the hall, and a shrill gasp. Two minutes and forty seconds of silence. Incoherent mumbling. Not funny. The sound again, within five feet of the recorder. A human voice, speaking almost above a whisper. It says a single wo word. Difficult to make out, but sounds like Deborah's name. The recorder rattles violently as it hits the floor. It's not funny. Stop it. Silence. Pit-pat of bare feet leaving the room. Three minutes pass, with no sounds, except a periodic thump deep within the house and Debra shouting angrily. The footsteps return. Heavy slam of the office door. Quiet sobbing, within three feet of the recorder, and nothing else for another minute. Speaking too quietly to register on the recorder, 
The throat has tightened up. The sobbing stops abruptly as Deborah holds her breath. The voice speaks again as quietly as before from inside the room, feet scrambling across the floor. The office window shrieks as it is torn open. The rest of the tape is silence. Deborah posted an update the same night. There was no trace of her usual snide narrative and she exchanged punchy one-liners for razor-edged curses. She wanted someone, me, to apologize to her for what she believed to be a perverse Halloween prank. She'd managed to keep one of the drawings she found under the loose floorboard and included a high-res scan in her rant, condemning it as an obvious attempt by a barely capable adult artist to reproduce the work of an eight-year-old retard. Drawn entirely in black crayon, it resembled a caricature of someone's living room as done by Salvador Dali. At the center stood a dark shape with a grayish head misshapen, like in a funhouse mirror, making it impossible to tell if it was supposed to be human or not. The thing stared right at the viewer over its shoulder with two empty black holes for eyes. Three more of the things stood beyond it, also staring at the viewer. It was as if the act of drawing the scene had grabbed their attention. Although their faces were amorphous, mushies of white and grey, the three in the background seemed to be smiling, and it really did suggest a level of artistic finesse beyond that of an eight-year-old boy. But the style matched. Jeff Daly's other drawings Deborah and I both got our share of hate mail after that blog. Half her readers thought I was an asshole for setting her up for such a nasty trick. The other half thought Deborah was pulling a hand up Halloween prank of her own. And when her next two updates erratically described how the sounds in the daily house had followed her home, everyone became all the more certain of this. They still believed it was a joke when she failed to make a single update for two weeks afterward. On November 4th, in the middle of the afternoon, Deborah had called her sister, Peyton. She was blubbering so much Peyton couldn't understand a word she said at first. She let loose with the heartbroken, drunk routine. Said she was sorry for missing my wedding. Sorry for always being a spiteful bitch when we were growing up. Sorry for kicking our dog when she was 12. Apologizing for all kinds of silly stuff, like a desperate sinner at confession. She stopped to catch her breath, and I heard somebody else in the room, with her talking quiet like they didn't want me to hear. I asked if she wanted me to come over. She started sobbing again and said, I hear daddy, but it isn't daddy. Then she hung up and I called the police. They didn't find anybody when they got there. I was talking to her only minutes before. Most folks still think Deborah's abduction by the whispering stalkers of Jeff Daly's nightmares is a hoax orchestrated by Deborah or by some other sick individual. The tape has been proven a fake by one ignorant skeptic after another, and it won't be long before Sugarcane Junction fades into obscurity once again. I hope to prevent this, not because I feel pity for Deborah Lindsay, Kane, though I really do pity her, but because I hope to prevent others from vanishing like she vanished, and like the city workers who found the tape vanished, and like my friend vanished. They marked their territory like they marked the Delhi house and the tape, and they can smell anything that comes in contact with it. Once they smell you, they hunt you like bloodhounds until they've marked you too. They call to you softly, like they're afraid to talk too loud, sometimes two rooms away, sometimes right next to you. They imitate people you're closest to. Maybe they think it's funny, but you can't listen to them. You have to shut them out 
otherwise you'll be too scared to open your eyes or move a muscle. You won't have the chance to kill yourself before they drag you to whatever unholy hell Deborah Lindsay Kane was taken to. I have to go take a bath with my toaster now. Mother has been calling to me for the last hour, even though she's been dead for five years. On May 4th, 1989, in my town of Cumbano, Scotland, a six-year-old boy by the name of Connor Doherty was reported missing by his mother, Joan. She reported that her son was particularly tearful one morning and seemed to be inconsolable. She attributed it to the random emotional tantrums and outbursts of a six-year-old, dismissing any seriousness of it. However, it's estimated that sometime that night, he vanished from his home without a trace. Detectives swooned in to try and find DNA samples left behind or other forms of evidence to confirm an abduction. But they found nothing. They worked tirelessly over the course of the next few years to try and locate the little boy, but to no avail. Connor has never been found. Four years later, on January 12th, 1993, nine-year-old Amy McKenzie was playing in her garden when she vanished. Her father, Adam, noted that she seemed bored or disengaged. She just sat on her garden bench and seemed to just be blankly staring into the grass below her. When her father returned to the garden to beckon Amy in for dinner, she was no longer there. She was nowhere to be seen in the surrounding areas either. Neighbors did not report seeing anyone strange or see anyone acting suspiciously near or in the garden at all. There were no witnesses. Amy has never been found. Five years later, a similar incident occurred when five-year-old Samantha Burley disappeared. The same pattern shown in the previous two cases were present in hers, odd behavior by the child, then a sudden and unexplained disappearance. Throughout the remainder of the 90s and the noughties, three more children disappeared in the same fashion. Our little town had become a helpless victim of media exploitation and the police department found itself under nationwide pressure to find all these lost children. Our town has since decayed and crumbled at the wake of these events. The foundations of our town collapsed, and our moral fiber and our sense of community have been completely destroyed. The place is now full of nihilistic, opportunistic youth, whiskey-chugging, hopeless law enforcement and emotionally dead civilians. They just exist now, getting through another grey, rain-drenched day. Then at night everyone in town cries themselves to sleep, every night over their lost children. I am one of those people. As the latest of these vanished children, eight-year-old Lisa Maddens, is my daughter. She was the perfect daughter. She was always kind and polite and had an incredible deal of maturity for someone her age. She was always respectful, humble, and for a child, rarely ever demonstrated self-centeredness. She was also the most passionate and imaginative child I've ever laid eyes on. She personified that youthful zest for life that we as adults prayed we could gain back. She would always have an exciting story to tell you about school, about play, or about our garden, which myself and her helped populate with some of the most gorgeous roses our community has ever seen. Yes, she was quite the gardener. She would ramble on for hours about it if you'd let her. She also loved everyone she met. We adults may be judgmental and skeptical of one another when we get older, but she saw the best in people. Everyone was her friend. We could all learn a lesson from her. And in the days leading to her disappearance, she wasn't showing any change in her passionate personality whatsoever. The only change in her behavior came from when, one Friday after I arrived home from work, I came in to find her already in bed. 
It was only six o'clock and it was light out. Her mother and my wife, Linda, said that she was tired and had a giant workload at school that day. It was strange. She usually battles her sleep valiantly, but not that day. And when I walked into the kitchen, I saw that she had drawn a picture and set it up on the fridge. She was fond of doing this. She always fancied herself as a future artist. She always asked for my opinion, to which I would immediately respond positively, even though I hardly ever paid attention to her doodles. The fact that I didn't has become one of those little things that makes tears roll down my cheek now that she's gone. This doodle, however, did grab my attention. It wasn't the typical childhood sketch. It involved nothing more than what seemed to be a hand sprawled palm down across the paper. I noticed that the fingers seemed longer and far more jagged and sharp than that of an average person. But this was an eight-year-old's drawing. I wasn't exactly expecting technical proficiency, but what did strike me as slightly peculiar is that the hand was completely black. It was totally monochrome, unusual, for the rainbow-like doodles Lisa usually churns out. I then noticed through the window, to my dismay, that the flowers in our garden had begun to wither and die. The colors seemed drained on them, something that I was dreading, telling Lisa. That night, Linda and I snuggled up on the couch and watched repeats of old game shows that were on. We were kids, we sipped on wine, and giggled at the ludicrous 1980s haircuts. I know most people would perceive our little Friday night as boring or banal, but we were as happy as we could be. That night we lay in each other's arms, emptied the last bottle of red and fell asleep on the couch. I awoke several hours later in the middle of the night due to the pounding rain on our window. The alcohol had taken its toll on my bladder and I needed to piss badly. I ran upstairs and did my business. After doing so, I decided to check on Lisa. She had been asleep for quite a while now. After all, I creaked open her bedroom door to find uh, the bed completely empty. My mind seemed to halt at this point. I couldn't think. I tried to dismiss what I was seeing, but I couldn't. I felt a vile sense of dread snowballing up inside of me. I tried calling out for Lisa and checking all the rooms. They were all empty. My wife awoke as my calls for Lisa grew louder and more panicked. Hearing my calls for our daughter, she froze, unwilling to ask me what had happened and confirm her fears. I bolted outside and began screaming at the top of my lungs. Lisa, Lisa! I frantically darted up and down my street to find her. Awakening several of her neighbors, I pressed them to see if they had seen anything. They hadn't. I found myself for what felt like hours wandering aimlessly through the streets that night, howling my daughter's name to no avail. How could this be fucking happening? I thought to myself. I still think that. I arrived home, tear-soaked and devastated to my wife, who was unable to stand or speak. She was just lying on the floor, curled up, shivering and sobbing like an infant. I covered her with a blanket and then called the police. I explained to them what happened and they said they would begin searching for her as soon as they could. I tried so desperately to force an ounce of optimism into my brain, but I knew it would be false. It was just like the others. She wouldn't ever be seen again. I knew it. My wife knew it. And I'm sure the police knew it too. Although we never dared to voice that to each other, or even ourselves, I spent the rest of the night embracing my poor wife. We cried the whole night through. They weren't the tears of a missing daughter. They were tears of grief. Following the incident, the police work went as expected. They found nothing. No leads, no traces as usual. 
The town found itself under media scrutiny once more, and everyone in town was being reminded of the horror that has plagued us for over 20 years. My wife and I's relationship became increasingly strained after the incident. She became more reserved and melancholic and began turning to alcohol to cope, something which caused an unbearable amount of friction and tension between us. As the months went on, I began to have nightmares which eventually began to spill into reality. I began to hear things and see things, horrible, deformed and repulsive apparitions of my daughter, haunting me, telling me to save her. I would see her at night when I looked out of my window. I would see her on the street waving goodbye to me. Before that, hand, that jagged black hand, which has now become cemented in my memory of that night, would drag her into the shadows. I began to isolate myself, even more than I was. Every time I went out, I couldn't help, but feel as if I were being watched or stalked. I began to see the rain as blood, and I saw people's faces contort and fade into a light, eating blackness. It was a horrifying and visceral reminder of what happened. I eventually got diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and put on strong doses of antipsychotics and my wife was diagnosed with depression. My wife and I split up not long after that. We couldn't live with each other anymore. Then my wife discovered that she couldn't live at all anymore. She took her own life not long after we split. I think that deep down I knew she was going to. I would too. If I had the courage, that was four years ago. My current living situation consists of a one-bedroom apartment I had to move to after I was let go of my job. Because of my illness, I now live off government welfare. I don't do much worth elaborating on except stare out of my window into the rain. It's particularly heavy today, I thought to myself as I dozed off in my single bed once more. I awoke to find myself in a forest, a beautiful, colorful forest. The weather was fantastic and the sun shone brightly, illuminating the many strong, beautiful colors in the trees. The noise of chirping birds gently brushed my ears and a cooling summer breeze shifted and weaved through my hair and fingers. I was completely relaxed. It was to this I realized that I was having that dream again. That recurring dream where I see myself and Lisa playing in these enchanted woods. It was one of my fondest memories of us. And sure enough, there we were. She was swinging from one of the makeshift swings that hung off of one of the stronger tree branches, the wind blowing her beautiful golden locks through the air. Her blue eyes shone bright with glee, and a giant joy-filled grin stretched across her rosy cheeks. I had noticed that every time I fall into this dream, I seem a further distance away from her than the last time. So I was placed fairly far back now. I watched with happiness as I see myself and my daughter together again, and sadness as I know one day I'll be placed too far. I watched on anyway, savoring the dream when I noticed. That wasn't me. The man with her was not me. As my eyes adjusted from the sunlight, I noticed that the man's face was just a pitch black void. Before I could get a closer look, heavy clouds formed at a rapid pace and it began pouring rain, obscuring my vision. I noticed my daughter's smile and joyful emotion began to drain from her face until all that was left was a dead, stoic expression. The swinging slowed to a halt and the thing leaned forward toward my daughter's ear and seemed to whisper something to her. Her face began to contort into an expression of profound despair and she began to sob painfully. She then looked up at and being with such gut-wrenching dread 
I felt like running after her, grabbing and beating the shit out of whatever this thing was, but I couldn't move. I was frozen. I tried to scream, but my lips were completely sealed. All I could do was watch this creature with my daughter. It then extended its hand, its grim, black, jagged hand, and placed it beside her own. She reluctantly locked her hand around its and begrudgingly left the swing. I stared in terror as I watched my daughter being dragged further and further into the soaking wet forest. Then, just before they faded into the rainy haze behind the trees, she turned to me, looking directly at me with those same eyes of such harrowing fear. She then mouthed something to me, something familiar, something which I heard as if it were being uttered directly in my ear. Save me. Everything faded to black at that point. I opened my eyes and found that tears had been rolling down my face and that body was gushing with sweat. I tried to sit upright and collect my thoughts, but... I still couldn't move. Every inch of my body felt as if it was glued to the bed. Only my eyes retained any motion. I felt mummified, a prisoner within my own body, as I attempted to shake and flail myself free of this paralysis, and then a thumping sound hit my ear. It came from behind my apartment door. My eyes then fixated on the door. It began to creak open. I then honed my stare on what was soon to be revealed. The hand, that horrid jagged hand slid digit by digit through my door. Then after black, long, disfigured and horridly inhuman limbs edged their way through the door, I gazed upon the pure, all-consuming darkness that stood there. A mist enveloped it. It oozed in and spread to every inch and crevice of my room, creating a hazy blanket of black fog as this spectre slowly began to enter and move toward me. I found my eyelids frozen as I tried to close them, to ignore the horror in front of me. No. Again, I was forced to watch as he towered and hovered over my paralyzed and petrified body. Its pitch, black face edged ever closer and closer to mine, until I could feel its breath on me, its smell of rot. I stared into the endless and bottomless black pit of its face seeing nothing but a featureless darkness, until its eye opened. Its eyelid peeled back, revealing a blinding white light, illuminating from the center of its face. It wasn't looking at me. It was looking past me. I felt as if it was looking into my mind, as soon I felt my brain pounding. I heard it, in my head. In a gravelly, low-pitched tone, I heard it whisper, Let go. Let go and you will see the truth all around you. Its eye then promptly shut and the darkness returned. It then raised its claw-like hand, produced something and held it front of me. It resembled a piece of paper, but as I looked closer I realized that it was a photograph. It was a photograph of a girl, around 10 to 12 years old. She had long overgrown and dirty hair, long overgrown and dirty nails, torn and messy attire, and her body was dotted and lined in countless bruises and cuts. I looked at the girl's face. She had a dead and soulless expression. Her skin looked bloodless and dreadfully pale, and dark rings encircled a deadpan, hollow and traumatized stare. It was then I noticed the bright blue color of her irises, it was then I realized that this girl was my daughter. My mind became paralyzed itself at this point. It was on static. All I could hear now was a persistent, sharp and stabbing ringing in my ear. I felt it sewing and cutting my brain apart. I felt my imprisoned body writhe in disgust and bile began to rise at the back of my throat. I felt my body collapse within itself. I felt as if I were dying. I wish I did, at that point. Then a wave of sorrow overtook me. My poor little baby. 
What did this thing do to you? Why would you do this? Why would you hurt an innocent little girl? I felt like shrieking at this creature. But of course, I was still completely paralyzed. It laid the photograph on my bed, and I watched as it slowly shifted his way out of my apartment, the black hellish mist following it. As soon as my apartment door slammed shut behind it, I found myself mobile again. I darted out of bed immediately, opened my door, and searched up and down the hallways for the creature. But it was nowhere to be seen. I then tried to calm myself down and attributed this to my psychosis. But I'm on a heavy dose of antipsychotics. How could this happen? I went back into my apartment, into my bathroom to try and take another dose of medication. It wasn't exactly a safe option, but I had to be sure. Just as I entered my bathroom, however, I noticed that my medication was gone. They had completely disappeared. Am I regressing? I asked myself. Did I get rid of my medication? Did I sleepwalk? But I surely couldn't be psychotic again. I hadn't missed a dose of my medication at all. It didn't seem possible. But that had to be it. That thing couldn't have actually existed. It couldn't have physically interacted with the world and got rid of my medication. Could it? I was about to exit the bathroom. Then I remembered that this operation had left the photograph on my bed. I recoiled back into the bathroom in intense anxiety at that point. My breathing became labored and heavy. It was just a hallucination. I kept repeating, there is no photograph. I found myself unable to exit. I was becoming engulfed with fear at what I was anticipating. I hesitantly left my bathroom, trying to avoid all eye contact with the bed. I shuffled towards it and laid my hands on my duvet. I slowly moved my hands across it, still averting my eyes, and I came across what felt like a piece of paper, although I knew that it wasn't. My heart collapsed and I apprehensively picked it up. My eyes met with it and my fears were confirmed. It was the photograph. It was real. It wasn't the product of a sleep. Paralysis induced hallucination. I was feeling it. It was real and that was my daughter. And that thing. Whatever it was. I knew I just knew that it was real too.